the real importance of relationship, friendship, is actually what I'm able to give, is actually how I'm able to change through it. Welcome to Spiritually Hungry. The poet William Blake said, it's easier to forgive an enemy than to forgive a friend. What strikes me about this quote is that it is sadly true. Today we're going to cover why that is. Our most important relationships are often our most complicated. Familiar relationships like parent-child, siblings, best friends, and partners. It feels easier to ignore that infuriating coworker, stop inviting a competitive acquaintance to a social gathering because the stakes are lower. But when relationships that matter are broken, it can feel excruciating. It hurts because we have loved them, probably still do. We have a rich shared history. And I think for those reasons and more, we expect even more from them. We expect that the love or the relationship will last forever. And often it doesn't. It's my intro. (laughs) So I don't know if you know, there's a phenomenon called the pursuer distancer dynamic. Yes. You do know it. Yeah. So Dr. John Gottman talks about this extensively. It's a common, it's common in marital relationships when one partner is the pursuer, meaning they desire more connection and closeness, and the other partner is the distancer as they start to pull away. And research at the Gottman Institute has found that when this dynamic happens in new marriages, they have an 80% likelihood of ending in divorce. Well, in new marriages, you hope that doesn't happen. Actually, just, I just met with a couple recently that um, he said he felt this he, shortly before they got married, and for sure six months after that's that. That he began. was pursuing, she was distancing. Yeah, that's a problem. Mm. But I think it is, in fact. <laughs> I, why would you get married? If that was really the, <clears throat> well, that, that's always my question. It's because it's funny whenever I hear that phrase, it, it seems to me that the truth is much simpler, right? One cares, one doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> right, pursuer distance or sounds so sort of complicated. It, is it really though? Yeah, because there's reasons that one will be distant. Yeah, because they don't care. <laughs> no, because think? no, I think because they don't have the tools of how to express themselves and show up. And I think the pursuer also is seeing. I'm sure that some. One second, even with the pursuer, it's that they're seeing what they desire and what they want, and not considering the other person. It, you can see it both sides, and and certainly with this couple I just worked with, it was that. Yeah, he was pursuing, he was more engaged, but she was distant because he didn't know how to meet her. And she, okay, that, and she wasn't pos- good at expressing that's it. That's possible. Right? But I know that we know many couples where the, the simple, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right, right? You can't oversimplify it because often that's the case. The pursuer is, doesn't necessarily know the right way to engage, and the, the distancer has different reasons why they're disengaging or not engaging. But, but there are situations where it's much clear cut, much more clear cut than that. Where the pursuer is really still interested in the relationship and the distancer is simply not interested in the relationship. We've seen that as well. Yes, but I still don't think it's black and white. I think they're not interested anymore because they don't think it's fixable. And that leads us back to the point of this topic today. Some people think that certain relationships are so broken, they're irreparable. Yeah. But I think, and I think this is right, this is where we want to focus today. Probably, I'm assuming every single one of our listeners has a relationship. That was meaningful at one point, and now longer no longer exists either because they decided to to uh, end the relationship or the other person did. And interestingly, there's a um, sociologist Anthony Giddens, who who really speaks about something which I think is w- really historical and worth considering. He said, up until the 1960s, relationships had an older model. He calls it role versus self. If you were a child, your expectations of yourself would be, were, to honor thy father and thy mother, for example. If you were in a friendship, it was, you know, you had the the expectation of yourself to continue the relationship. From the 1960s onwards, he, there's been a shift in, in expectations, right? Where and again, he refers to it as the pure relationship, which is pure, pure relationship, which is which is the opposite of what it sounds like. Which is that most people today are are in the process of evolution towards desiring only relationships that are perfect for them, right? So that if you are saying something, you know, I really like you, but this ten percent of what you say really upsets me, 
okay, I move on. Well, there's so many the options there. The model is different. If you don't like this thing, there's another thing around the corner. Well, yes. So, so I think it's really worthwhile <laughs> to to realize that what we're talking about here is not simply, you know, uh, an experience that any one of us individually has. There has actually been a collective shift of humanity from what he calls from role to self, but basically what it means is that we are much more absolute as, as, a, as humanity in the relationships that we accept and or we cut off. And th- I think that's a big problem. It's a big problem for many reasons. And I would ask, or, you know... I, well, I, I think you need to be clearer here. So, whereas in, in, in the pre- previous... Uh, evolution of humanity, relationships had much greater leeway, which was, as a child to a father, to a mother, you the expectation of yourself was that those channels remain open. That relationship lasts Was that forever. the expectation of yourself, or was yeah. that just what was clear and what we were supposed to model? I mean, today, in the world we live in, there's so many different relationships that you can model. You can, it's, it's just so, so many options. I don't think that, like, why was the expectation of self different then than it is now? It just was. I, I think, I think I, it's more the expectation of society. Well, you can you can talk about why, but it's definitely a fact that it was a different or what was society. norm, what was accepted yeah, as norm. Exactly the, the, the society within which we lived. Again, not we, but people up until the nineteen sixties, approximately, where the expectation was that you maintain those relationships, friendships, family, from the nineteen sixties. 60s onwards, there is this greater focus on the self, which basically, as it translates in relationships, is I am in this relationship as long as it is pure, which which is a bad word, but uh, as long as it is fulfilling a hundred percent, basically of my, of my needs, needs uh-huh. which is a very big problem, you know. And and I hear almost every week I hear about a father who's estranged from a daughter, or a daughter estranged from the father because oh, they trigger me. Triggered. Yeah. And again, and to be clear, of course, there are the extremes where that is the case, where there was abuse, where there was something really out of extraordinary. But most of the cases, I actually I had dinner last week with, with one of the students, and he was sharing that his daughter is estranged from him because whenever she sees him, she, she's triggered. By what? Because of, of trauma that she said she had as a child. And 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 I asked him, was it real? He said, well, of course. And again, he admits, I wasn't a perfect father, but he wasn't an abusive father in any way. And I think that that there's a big problem developing, uh, you know, at least over the past 40 years, where people give themselves the, the leeway to say, if this relationship isn't exactly as I want it to be, I'm out. Not my family, my chosen family, right? And it's a big problem for many reasons. And I think... And I mean, my, the first my, my first point is that I think it's important to realize that as a society we've strayed away, or allowed ourselves to stray away from from relationships, um, just because you know there's a part of them or, or 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 elements of them that we say don't work for us. And if I, well, yeah, there is. It's statistically more and more people are cutting their parents off. Yeah, um, yeah. and are estranged. Which interesting. What's interesting though is that. It doesn't give them the peace that they're seeking. Ninety percent of people estranged from a family member report finding the holidays, in fact, the whole month of December. Social media posts about families and even being around other families to be challenging. Of course, I'm sure. I'm sure that's true because, and this I think takes us to a spiritual truth with it, which I'd like all of our listeners to think about: what is the purpose of family relationships, friend relationships? You have to take a step further back and say, what is the purpose of my existence in this world? reason is because I came in a certain way, and I meant to go through this life in, through a process of change. And the most powerful way for us to change is from our relationships. And if you look at life in that way, that the reason why I want to have a relationship with my wife, with my son, with my friend, with my father, isn't because of what they give me, Right, but rather because of the opportunities that they give me to grow and to change, and maybe more importantly, to give. That's a real paradigm shift, I think, for most people from how they view. And certainly, as as society tells us, or at least a majority of us, how our relationships should be. I really, again, this is literally 
again, I think degrees. we have to preface it with obviously if you're in an abusive relationship or uh, one where you just feel like you know it's not you're not happy to be there. But still, even when people come to me, they want to get divorced or they're they're really struggling. I always say that even if you end up at the end of this deciding that you don't want to be here together anymore there's still a reason you came together and you're still in the middle of a process so at least see it through and i think what we're talking about today specifically is what process looks like even if somebody who is estranged with their parents let's say maybe you need to do that for a short period of time to create some kind of boundary or to have a a reset right but ultimately it's still you're in the middle of a process and kabbalistically we believe that if you don't see that through in this lifetime you're going to need to have another opportunity either in this lifetime with other relationships that mirror that or with those same souls that came in this incarnation will come in the next incarnation. So it behooves you no matter what to see the process through. And again, it doesn't mean that you choose to keep that relationship per se or to be the, the best of friends or to stay married or to really enjoy every exchange you have with your parent. But you understand that the process is the purpose and you find great value in that. So there's always more to learn about yourself and to evolve and change your perspective. Absolutely. That being said, so there's about, let's say, I don't know what the percentages are, 10 to 15% of friendships, of family relationships that are on the extreme and therefore the individual is right in in creating boundaries. But the other 85% of relationships that end or that are where there's an estrangement, I would I would posit are the effect of the individual not pursuing change and having the wrong view on what a relationship actually is. If if you if I asked most people what's friendship to you, the first list, if you made a list of ten things, I'm sure the top ten, top five, top seven will be what I get from the relationship. But the reality is the real importance of relationship, friendship, is actually what I'm able to give, is actually how I'm able to change through it. So actually, having people around me who aren't exactly like me, who aren't exactly, you know, interested in the same things I'm interested in, aren't exactly supportive of the same things that I support, is actually the best thing for me. Well, it's interesting because I think often when I speak to one person in the relationship, if I have them alone, um, because they meet with them as a couple, but then when I speak with them one-on-one, they say, well, if I knew this was my soulmate, then I'd, I'd be okay to endure all of this, right? They want to have a guarantee that this relationship is worthwhile. And what we're saying is it's worthwhile simply because there's something that is being awakened in you that you can change and grow in yourself or learn about somebody else to even prepare you for other relationships in your life. But far too often, if it doesn't feel great all the time or it doesn't fit into their ideal of what the relationship should be based on other things they see out there, like that's it. I'm done. Right. I would say there's two general categories of, of of what causes relationships to 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 break. One is that over time, again, these are people who you know have opinions that I don't like or are doing you know things that I don't like. The second is one big thing that happened. Right. So I want to talk about that second category of things. You know, we've all had relationships where something happened. Right. It was a great relationship, it was a great friendship, and then something happened. And then people are just not willing to, to forgive, aren't willing to get past it. And there again, I would say the following, and I, I've often had these conversations, I'm a big, big believer in, in, in mending, especially significant... By the way, the reflexive desire usually is when something goes really badly, is to run from it. It's not to go back and repair it, or fix it, or talk about it, right? right. So it's really fighting that innate desire. Again, I, I've I've had this conversation with many people that that if you had a significant relationship and and or friendship, and then something happens, and even if it was in your opinion something bad, again, always the caveat if it was something terrible, right? In the ten percent extreme, five percent extreme is one thing, but often it's not that. It's something that happened. They did something that you thought they absolutely should not have done, or they did something that really disappointed you. My view into this would be first, if this is an important relationship, you fight for it. You don't choose the easier way out. You fight for it. And I, I have found that too often people are not willing to forgive, are not willing to give that grace, are not willing to have the challenging conversation in order to maintain uh, a significant relationship. And I, would, and I would ask all of our listeners right now, can you think of a, a relationship that you gave up on, or a relationship that something happened, 
uh, that you that upset you, disappointed you, and from then that way, from that point onward, you gave up on that relationship. Because also to that point, it's when you don't take the time to repair it, or even if you can't repair it, just see your partner or what you can learn from it. It still stays with you. It stays on your mind, and chances are you don't feel great about yourself. And like, why can't I make this relationship work? Whether it's a parent or a child, it that's, never feels. By good. the way, that's sometimes the case. Unfortunately, I've heard a lot of them where, oh, I am absolutely in the right. They're absolutely in the wrong. Out of my life. But I'm sure it's still in their minds and hearts. I hope so. I would hope so. I. It scares me the most when people are, feel that they're absolutely in the right. Right. And but again, I, I think. It's it's worthwhile to underscore the importance of friendship, and one of you know the the longest study of um, really the longest study ever conducted is uh, the Harvard study of adult development, right? That began in nineteen thirty eight, and do you, know, you, you I'm sure you've heard of this study where they they had two cohorts of of, of people in the study. First, one group was were Harvard undergraduates. And the second group were uh, children from from um, disadvantaged families in the Boston area, and they followed them from 1938, and it continues. It's crazy. Obviously, a lot of people have died <laughs> from from this right. from this group, but they found because they, their the goal of this study was to find what are the parameters, what are the reasons, what are the the forces that that allow human thriving, and they found the single most important determining factor about whether a person will thrive and be happy and healthy is how many strong the health of the relationships relationships they have uh, and if you not think surprising really it's not surprise well it's yes and no right because you would think you know like, where you come from education job family and if you understand it that way and, by, yeah. and, I, and, I, and I believe everything that that science proves has a spiritual reason behind it and if we understand that this, as we said earlier, that the the reason we exist, and the reason why our soul comes into this world, is to share with as many people as possible, and for ourselves to grow from that, then of course it makes sense that when you study what makes people happy and and growing and developing and and and, and thriving, it is the strength of their relationships. So, if you needed inspiration or an understanding about why it's so important to fight. For the important relationships, to give grace and forgiveness, even when somebody has disappointed you, whether it be a family member or a friend, is because if you want to live long, if you want to have happiness, fight for your relationships. Well, it's interesting. I actually, to that point, um, there's a woman named Elizabeth Lesser. She's a best-selling author and founder of the Omega Institute, and she used this starting point to repair her relationship with her sister. She started with this very simple question, how did I hurt you? And then asked, will you forgive me? So her sister Maggie needed a bone, a bone marrow transplant to save her life. Elizabeth learned that she was the perfect match, but the relationship was complicated. And with the understanding that more than just bone marrow would need to be transplanted into Maggie, the two sisters began to do the hard work necessary to heal physically and emotionally. Elizabeth called it the soul marrow transplant. In order to give her sister the best chance possible for a successful transplant, the sisters dig deep into their family history to uncover assumptions, transgressions, and old pain. She didn't want either of their cells to reject the transplant. Interesting. They knew that they would have to completely realign the relationship down to the cellular level by reexamining their childhood and their intimate relationship with honesty and authenticity. There, they were able to forgive each other. And I think that's just so profound. And then Maggie lived for a year after the transplant. And that time, the two sisters continued their deep work of connection and forgiveness. And Elizabeth said that her biggest lesson was this, there's less to forgive if we're honest in real time. Instead of letting assumptions fester into grudges, we can own what we've done and ask others to do the same. Maggie and I did this, and we got an abiding eternal love for each other out of bargain. And I think you know you you often speak about the fact that that we get stronger individually, personally in the broken places. I think that, and I've found this with certain relationships that when when you fight for the relationship and you get over disappointments, hurts, you actually have the possibility of making an even stronger relationship than it was before. 
and also your relationship with self. I, I don't. I really don't think people. I mean, look, it depends on consciousness, but I. I don't think anybody feels good about not getting along with others, especially the people that they I, love. I, I, I would know. beg to differ. I think in our world today, there are so many, again, not to disparage anyone, anybody who, who might be listening or anybody that you know, self-righteous people uh, here's who are the thing. so sure. I, I, I just like, again, I just think these are, these are the people that I, that I don't want to say dislike because I don't dislike anybody too much, but people who are so self-righteous, they're so sure that they're, what they're saying is right, and anybody who doesn't see it their way is absolutely wrong, and because of that, they can't be near them or friends with them or family with them. Unfortunately, I think it's. I, I, I would. I would actually argue that that a vast, I don't know, if majority, but a very large group of people living today have this view of themselves and others. Yeah, but where does it come from? I think. Oh, I, honestly, no, it's ego. I mean, yeah, it's ego. Because, it's it's where our society is. It's self righteousness. Oh, in every but, exchange, we have the choice to either make somebody feel heard, seen, and respected, or make them feel small, powerless, judged, and insulted. And it really does come down, I think, ju- mostly, yes, to ego, because um, ego is an excellent shapeshifter. If you think about it, sometimes it emerges as jealousy, gossip, animosity, or judgment. Other times it shows defensiveness, selfishness, or pride, and it it ha- it binds us. And the more that you live in that place, the of course you're going to see that you're right and others are wrong. And then I think the other thing that happens, you're not really interested in repairing because you're more interested in how you feel about being right. Exactly. But I don't think I still don't think those people feel good. Is what I'm saying. Well, it's hiding <laughs> deep down inside because I've met people like this. And well, it reminds me we just watched a movie. What was it called? The, the Holdovers. The Holdovers, and I didn't even know you're like it's a comedy. It, it was supposed it, to be. It, it wasn't it, so much. It had comedy. funny parts, but it was not a comedy. It was a drama. Um, I wouldn't have watched it if I knew it was. A I drama. loved it. I was happy I know, to watch I'm it because you never watch those movies with me. But I think it was really about that. It was people who, especially the main character, you know, they present him as not being likable. People don't, this, you know, he's a teacher, fellow uh, staff members don't like him. Students don't like him. They made him look a little bit different. So you're kind of like, oh, well, why does he look like that? And and so you don't trust him. But at the end, you realize that he was broken. And because he was broken, he could recognize the brokenness in others. And then he helped them become whole. And I, I, I just think that I stand behind this. I think that people can live their lives like that for 50, 60, 70, 80 years, but then there comes a point where... If, they, if they're lucky. Right, but the point is, even in the movie... As I, the I character always thought you were more from, optimistic than I was. <laughs> no, no. Am I optimistic? I th- I think that that there's work that humanity needs to do and that individuals... It's And we've, we've spoken about this. My, again... I try to be as as uh, great to give as much grace as possible, but the people who I find the most difficult to to respect are people who are self righteous, because I think and, and this is one of the reasons and I sp- and I've spoken about this, but one of the reasons that 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 I you know what was special about my mother is that she was able to see people and even if they had done all kinds of stuff that that was let's say obviously not great she was able to give love and grace and i think that as human beings that's probably one of the most important things that we need to do right it doesn't mean you condone bad behavior of course but it doesn't mean on the extremes you don't stand up but but too often we people judge others in self-righteousness and therefore don't give benefit of the doubt and therefore break off relationships and you know i we always say that spiritually if you want to be shown kindness and mercy you you should go out of your way to constantly show more kindness and mercy towards others and i don't think as a collective we humanity we don't do it enough i agree but i I, and i'll just say this one other thing when we're steered by our ego, right? Because the more you feed the ego, the more power it has, the more control it has, we lose our authenticity. And then we lose touch with who we are and where we fit into in the larger scheme. So again, we're less interested in making things work because we're living in our own our own. No, and that's why I think for the most part, if you want to be a good friend and you want to have good friends, I think the the spirit what I would call the spiritual work, which is as we said before, really think about how can I give more in this relationship 
than receive? How can I give more grace? How can I give more forgiveness? How can I fight for it? Well, these are all things that I think are are underpinned well if it comes from the perspective that the relationship isn't supposed to be just what I get from it. Isn't supposed to be pure in the sense that I get everything I want and that you know everything about you is is what what I want to receive. Because I think again the the sad part, the sad reality of people and all of us have broken relationships when we shouldn't have is that we are lesser for it. We we just the Harvard study tells us we'll be we'll thrive more, we'll grow more, we'll be happier, we'll be healthier if we fight more and more for the for the relationships that we sometimes too easily let go of. There's a section in the Zohar that I love. It says whoever inclines us toward a negative reaction actually deserves our gratitude. And I know at first it's going to be hard for people to hear. They provide us with a chance through our own efforts to turn away from negativity and by so doing to reveal light. This is the true role of evil in the world. It provides us an opportunity for us to become the cause and the creator of our own light and thereby to fulfill our purpose in this world. So it's basically saying that difficult friends are good for us. Yeah. Exactly. Even the most challenging ones. And then the way I behave towards them is how the light or right. the, S, the creator will behave towards me. Yeah. And I'd like to also share maybe in the, a deeper idea, which I think is important to think about as we think about friendships and forgiveness and repairing friendships and relationships. And that is that every action that we do does not only impact directly the relate. Let's say if I'm having a, a, an argument with you, it's not just our repair repairs our relationship, but that everything we do actually affects the collective, meaning the totality of humanity. And if you look at the world today, there certainly is not enough mercy. There certainly is not enough kindness. There certainly is not enough forgiveness. And often, especially in times of war and strife, people ask me, you know, what 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 can we do? What should we do? And of course, there are, this, that's a long list. But one of the important understandings is that as I behave in my life, in my relationships, so I impact the world. Of course, the more spiritual I am, the more, the more evolved I am, the more the greater my impact. But every single one of us has an effect on the world. So think about it this way. If there's a relationship in your life that you're having trouble forgiving, if you have somebody in your life that you're having trouble being kind to, do it, if not for the fact that it will better your relationship with them, and then hopefully, as the Harvard study tells us, lead to a more fulfilling and healthy and, and, and thriving life, but also because the world needs it. And really do it with that consciousness. I'm going to go out of my way to heal this, this relationship, to forgive this person, to show grace to that person, to show kindness to this person. Not because who they're doesn't right, deserve, exactly. But because I want that be, to be the energy that I put out into the world. And you know, in our lifetime, I don't know if there was another time that so desperately needed kindness and grace and mercy and forgiveness, and to know that you impact the world. And one of the reasons why this person in your life is causing you to be upset, and one of the reasons why this person is causing upset or this person has hurt you is because it is given, it is for you to have the opportunity to forgive. And through their forgiveness, again, not only have, hopefully, maybe, a better relationship with that person, but also that's the energy that you are putting out into the world, and the world needs it. So, as I see it, there is four steps to starting this process and making amends. The first is recognize your own responsibility. Even if you think it wasn't your fault, chances are you played a part, even if it is a small one. Two, let go of the idea that you can align their story with yours. A lot of people try to do this, especially in relationships. I can't tell you how many times they sit Explain that. across two people, and they have very different stories, night uh-huh. and day, of what has happened. <laughs> and like The truth is somewhere in the middle, but you are never, and they are fighting over who whose story is true. You are two different people. Your stories are never going to be the same. Set boundaries. Maybe there are topics you are not willing to discuss. Know what they are, and know when it is time to pause and return to the conversation later. And I would say the fourth is professionals can help. Sometimes a therapist, a counselor, a mediator can be the kind of outside energy perspective that you need to see the bigger picture. Right. And ultimately, or additionally, when repair is not possible, somebody 
has hurt you so much or or they aren't open to having the conversation, there's still forgiveness you can do in your own heart. You know, you get to a place where you think of that person in a different way, even if you can't have the conversation right away. And I would just leave our listeners with this idea. You know, somebody, we, a good friend of ours, often quotes her dad, and he said, you know, you can never make new old friends, right? You can make new friends, but you can't make new old friends. And I think there's this great truth to that. And I always like to view it from the, I don't know if the word is selfish perspective, or I would say the spiritually selfish perspective. You will do better for yourself by allowing forgiveness, by, by allowing for grace and kindness. And you will see that you change in the ways that you need to. You grow in the ways that you need to. And an added bonus benefit will be that you actually are able to maintain longer old friendships. I'd like to share uh, one of the reviews that our, one of our listeners left on Apple Podcasts. This podcast has something for everyone. It's profound for someone like me that has been in his spiritual work for more than 30 years, and yet it can be heard, understood, and used by somebody that just started. The balance between the down-to-earth explanations and high spiritual concepts, it's incredible. Thank you for that review, and this is the perfect time to remind our listeners to go to Apple Podcasts and write five-star reviews, share this podcast with everybody you know, and write your stories, comments, questions, inspirations to Monica and Michael at spirituallyhungry.life, Monica and Michael at spirituallyhungry.life. Share your stories with us, share your inspirations with us. You get to share them with all of our listeners, and you get all of that benefit as well. And as always, we hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as we enjoyed recording it. Stay spiritually hungry. <laughs>